I think maybe I'll just start by saying two words about the International Trade Union Confederation. So it's a global federation of almost all of the world's unions. It represents 207 million organized workers in 162 countries. And um, if anybody would know about uh, complex, intractable, and shared problems, it might actually be trade unions because that is our reality in a lot of countries where we work. Um, the question before us tonight is what is purposeful leadership from business in the face of a climate emergency but also a social emergency? Because we do have a social emergency in this country and in other countries. And part of the problem of addressing a climate emergency is that our political and social fabrics are breaking down. And so unless we are able to pull together, we're not going to be able to solve the mother of all complex, intractable, and shared problems, as Carolyn said at the start. So let me just lay a little bit of groundwork about Just Transition, then I'll give you some concrete examples, because I'm sure you may have heard the phrase before, but it might be hard to know exactly what it is. It's in the Paris Climate Agreement, it require, which requires parties to consider the issue of just transition and the creation of decent jobs, right? It's also part of the International Labor Organization, which is a UN body tasked with everything relating to the world of work, and it consists of union representatives, employer representatives, and governments, and it negotiates global standards on work, for example, standards on slavery and also on just transition. So we have a global guideline on just transition that was negotiated in 2015. Now, in the aftermath of the Paris Agreement, the International Trade Union Confederation and its affiliates around the world, we had been working really hard, not only to get a global climate agreement, but to get a recognition of the importance of a just transition for working people into it. In fact, that has been a campaign from unions for more than two decades. But uh, when we woke up in January of 2016, we realized that we had relatively few examples of just transition, and also that our affiliates and their members and their families and communities, working class communities, that they might appreciate some support in getting concrete agreements on just transition. So that's when the Just Transition Center was created. So what is just transition? Well, it's two things, and I'll give you two international examples, although you can probably see how they might apply here as well. So one is, um, for example, in, uh, I was recently in South Africa to meet with our mining and energy unions, and South Africa is facing a range of issues. One of them is about the future of its power company, ESCOM, uh, which, primarily burns coal, supplies 95% of the country's energy, um, employs some 40,000 people, plus all of the people who are employed in coal mining in the country. This is a country with 37% uh, structural unemployment, and so these jobs in the power sector and in the mines, these are actually really good jobs, and every person who is employed is supporting somewhere between 10 or 12 other people. And that might seem kind of remote until you think about places in the UK which have been hit by deindustrialization, where uh, a good job in the public sector is really, really worth a lot. And cutting those jobs is a really painful thing for the people employed there and their families. Um, a just transition in South Africa for its power sector looks pretty challenging right at this moment. Um, but, uh, but what it would entail would be um, for any workers who might lose their jobs as part of the process both of changing the, the role of coal in, the, in power generation, um, those workers would get a path to a new and equivalent job. They would be retrained, as we say, retain, retrain, and redeploy. Older workers 
For example, if you went down into the mines when you were 16, you are actually physically ready to retire when you're in your late 40s, if you look at the life expectancy of coal miners. So that would be a path to early pension for miners. And it would be a plan for the communities that today are really relying on the employment, both direct and secondary, for, um, from coal mines and from the coal-fired power plants. So it would be an economic plan for revitalization of these communities. And last but not least, it would be what we would call social protection, which is this foundation of social services that make it, make it so that people are not miserable and fearful and living in poverty if they're unemployed, but where they have access to, they actually have health care, they have education, they have income support, um, they have all of the things that, that uh, make, make it possible to live a life with dignity. So that's one part of just transition. That's what a lot of people think it's all about. It's about coal miners, it's about the transition away from coal, and it's about uh, distressed communities. Definitely is about that. But it is at least as much about the new jobs and making sure that those jobs are good jobs. And so just to give another example, last week um, with uh, sisters and brothers from the US Union Movement, I was uh, meet with them in meetings at the headquarters of Ersted and Equinor and Vestas and uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, who are all active here. Uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners is engaged with Scottish Power um, in the offshore wind industry to talk about the offshore wind boom that is coming to the United States, 20 gigawatts of wind between now and 2030, and how we could get social dialogue, dialogue between employers and unions, good collective bargaining agreements, and make sure that all of the new jobs that are gonna be created in this massive value chain that you're gonna have for offshore wind, that those are good jobs, that they pay a prevailing wage, that people have pension and healthcare, that you have money for training, you have safety and rights at work. Why is that important if you're an employer? I mean, for some of you this might be obvious, others not so much. Because the very people who are going to be voting and be politically active for this transformation, the people who are working in your companies today who have the knowledge and skills as you try to bring down your emissions, those people are the people you should be talking to first, right? Because those people um, are going to fear change. Our members are not, uh, we, confront industrial change all the time, but we, we need to understand that at the other end of the change, there will be good jobs and security. And if people don't understand that, then they're going to resist that change to their last breath because otherwise they don't know how they're gonna support their families. Just put it out there. Let me just mention a few other things that we have done to create resources and a landing space for employers. Because again, you know, in the union movement, yes, sometimes we're in conflict with you all. But we also depend on you all to stay in business, to transform, and to create good jobs in the future. Right? So we have a relationship of mutual interdependence uh, at its best, where we can manage change together. We, um, with the B team, and I believe Emily, you'll hear from Emily Hickson of the B team later on this evening, we created a guide for business on just transition, which you can find online, and it explains to employers the steps in a sort of simple, simple way, the steps that you need to go through in order to implement just transition. The first one, of course, would be don't union bus. You actually need unions, you need orga an organized workforce in order to manage this kind of change in a good way. Um, a second thing that we did was we created a pledge for employers that was launched at a big climate event last year. Um, employers first in the renewable energy sector basically committing to creating decent jobs throughout their value chain as they build out the energy system of the future. And that is the pledge for just transition and decent jobs and uh, Ersted, which is the world's largest developer of offshore wind has taken it, along with NL, which is either the largest or one of the largest developers of renewable energy in the world. And the, th the third thing that we're doing is we're going to have a global day of workplace action. So we're asking all of our unions and uh, their members on June 26th 
to talk to their employers and to ask the employers, what is your plan? Because actually, if you're gonna bring down emissions in a way that corresponds to a climate emergency, you're gonna need a plan for that, right? And that plan must also include a plan for the workforce. Our members know this, right? Everybody understands the situation that we're in and that big changes are coming to all sectors eventually, but to some sectors faster than others. So in June, if you get a letter from your union reps, from the shop steward asking for a meeting, asking you to come and to discuss a plan for transforming the company and bringing down emissions, I hope that you sit down at the table and have that conversation. It's really an important conversation to have. The last thing I want to say about just transition is that, of course, there is a role for government. There is a very important role, and also for local government. But I agree with the Lord Mayor that we need national governments to come to the table. That is what happened in Germany relatively recently, where the gov national government set up a relatively broad commission, including unions, mining and energy unions, industrial unions, power sector unions, regional government, um, environmental groups, national government, and they negotiated a complete phase out of coal in Germany's power sector over the next 19 years. Um, no person who is employed in, uh, in the power plants or in the mines that are, that are supporting them will lose his or her job involuntarily. There will be a pathway for every single worker. And as, a, as well as reinvestment in these deindustrialized regions in East Germany, um, with things that will create jobs, like high-speed rail, broadband, you know, new schools and hospitals, things that make it attractive for people to stay and work in this area. And um, as a result, Germany is going to transform its power sector. It's going to go from being a sort of powerhouse of both coal mining and burning coal, but also emissions, to breaking new ground in uh, providing electricity for its industry and households. So when government comes to the table, when employers come to the table, because they were also part of this commission, when unions come to the table, we can do pretty big things on climate together, and we can also do things at the city level as we're doing in the city where I live, Oslo, which uh, is reducing its transport emissions 40% in two years. So I'll just leave you with that. We're gonna have some questions. Happy to answer any you may have, thanks.